I'm going to ask that you open to the book of Romans this morning, to the book of Romans chapter 8. Some would say the greatest chapter in the Bible, so we'll not rush through it, we'll consider it prayerfully in the sight of God comparing Scripture with Scripture and rejoicing in the outcome and the understanding that God provides through the Holy Spirit who lives and reigns in us. Oh, Father, in Jesus' name, bless the saints this morning. Open to Romans chapter 8. And we'll read verses 15 through 17. And so the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome of the first century, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're children of God, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. Add your presence to the reading and proclamation of this, your holy word, O Lord. Unlock for us this morning the deep things of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we have our three verses. It's sort of a three-point sermon, if you will, of the Apostle Paul. He gives three different aspects of the Spirit's effect on our lives. It's about the Holy Spirit this morning. He bears witness with our spirit. What could that possibly mean? It means at the very least he comes up alongside us and bears all things with us from inside us, from the inside out. And so the faithful have become that holy place, that holy of holies, that only those who are consecrated by God can go. Like the inner sanctum, the holy of holies of the tabernacle in the wilderness, where only the priest properly consecrated could go, and even him only once a year. And where if he entered in not properly consecrated, he would be summarily zapped out of existence by a holy God that cannot have sin in his sight. It's an awesome thought when you think about it, but God has declared us holy. We are, the, we are our own priests before God, and we enter into the temple, and the Holy Spirit is in the temple, whose temple you are, Paul said to the Corinthians. You are the temple of the Holy Ghost, as we said in times past. There was an old story about the high priest going into the holy of holies, and they would tie a rope, a consecrated, ritualistically clean rope, to his ankle. In case he did get zapped in there, they could get him out, because they didn't get to go in. I don't know if the stories are true or not, but it does go along with the teaching. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I'll suggest to you this morning that this action of the Spirit of God spoken of in this verse is distinct from the action in the previous two verses. You know, it's interesting, we sometimes as we read through the Bible, and people have said this, and I do want to thank you for your interest in the series. I got so much commentary the last few weeks, particularly last week, um, of people who had not stopped to really meditate on the words that Paul uses the words are well chosen. They are, in fact, determined by God. They are God's inerrant word to us. And we must not think the apostle is overly repetitive or choosing words frivolously. The words are meant there for our affirmation and our edification. So I want to suggest to you this morning that the Apostle Paul's not repeating himself in these three verses, but he's building upon our understanding of the actions of the Holy Spirit with one action and a second and then a third. And so verse 14 spoke of the saints being led by the Spirit of God. We labored over what this meant a couple of weeks ago. And as we saw, this action is a more specific thing than one might imagine if the previous verse is not considered in the interpretation. 
It had to do with putting sin to death, of mortifying sin. It had to do with an action of the saint that the Spirit engenders in him, that the Spirit prompts in him. The Spirit comes in you, but he prompts you to mortify the flesh in your own hearts. You're already saved, but there's residual sin, and the Holy Spirit comes in to reveal that to us and to prompt us to put it to death, put to death the deeds of the body, Paul wrote. And this verse is in connection with that leading, if we take it specifically in the context. It might have been called a spirit of conviction. It might have been called a spirit of self-examination in that the leading is in the matter of residual sin abiding in the newly washed saint because what Paul is talking about here and unfolding to us as a work of the Holy Spirit by the finished work of Christ is salvation itself and the assurance that goes with it. He would have us be assured. He would have us enjoy our walk with God. In verse 15, the apostle refers to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of adoption. So we had the spirit of bondage to fear. Now we have the spirit of adoption. And the act of a newly adopted child of God is what? To cry out to his father. Just as Jesus said, pray therefore like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, the Holy Spirit prays within us in the same way that Christ taught us to pray. And we pray by the Spirit of Abba, which is in us. And so again, there's something that we need to do in and of ourselves that's prompted by the Spirit. Recognize that God is your Father. Now there is some witness of this in the Old Testament, but generally speaking, they don't speak to God as Father. They speak to him as sort of an aloof overlord. But we have this new intimacy where we call God Abba, the old Aramaic word for father. So the first verse inspires a leading of the Spirit. And the second, a grafting into the family of God. And in both cases, the Holy Spirit causes the saint to perform. In verse 14, the believer takes action to mortify the flesh, to put to death the deeds of the body. And in verse 15, he cries out to God as Father. But here in verse 16, the apostle offers a different emphasis. Is it just repetition? Or is he building upon the actions of the Spirit, one after the other? He speaks of the, in this case, the Spirit himself. There's an emphasis that perhaps we don't want to overlook, as some have. It is as if to say that this is solely an act of the Spirit, and there's nothing added, as in the way of a joint action between the believer and his God. He says here, the Spirit himself bears witness. And so he bears witness, and we receive the witness. And it seems to me there is in this no sense of confusion. When God shows up, he's unmistakably God. When the Spirit bears witness with your witness, you're not confused about who he is. And I intend to elaborate on that theme this morning. When the Spirit moves upon the spirit of an adopted child, he moves in decisively. Now, there are, there are, as you might imagine, various interpretations of just what it means to bear witness. And I have a certain affinity for all of them. But I think decisively, only for one of them. Some see it as the action of the Spirit upon any and every believer in a very ordinary way. This is just the ordinary day-to-day -day action of the Spirit. He bears witness with our spirit. We tended to do that with verse 14 about being led by the Spirit of God. Just sort of an ordinary thing. It's an internal word. We think of this bearing witness as an internal word of God or a, or a comfort or a quiet sensing of the presence of God with all the commensurate assurances that come with this type of spiritual sensation. The Spirit comes alongside us to comfort us in times of trouble. And that's one of the beliefs as to what this, what this verse is intending to convey. 
Others believe that the verse refers to an extraordinary act, something not ordinary, an act of the Spirit. And it is this emphasis of the Spirit himself that Paul says. He doesn't say that anywhere else. The Spirit himself, from which they derive this emphasis. Now, Paul emphasizes the action, and so the commentators seize upon the emphasis as a specialized form of witness. Commentators of every stripe put varying degrees of emphasis upon the statement. I'll give some of them to you. The beloved Dr. J. Vernon McGee, consummate Christian and Texan, um, who wrote at a radio Bible show for many years. I see um, some of you smiling about that and recognizing those days. He had a sort of a very entertaining way of speaking. Now I say to you, my friend. <laughs> um, but J. Vernon McGee, I, I, I go to him often because sometimes, um, even though he's not uh, a theologian after my own heart in some ways, uh, he does, by the way, claim adamantly to be a Calvinist. I didn't know if you knew that. I didn't. In several of the commentaries, he claims that. And uh, I praise God for that because I always had him in the other camp. But McGee offers a single small paragraph. And so what he does is he goes in his through the Bible expositions. He has the verse and then he says what he thinks about the verse or what he's discovered about the verse. And he had one single small paragraph of this verse as the two verses before it. And he offers a personal experience to illustrate the meaning. He speaks of having a long career pastoring, of visiting the sick in the hospital, and of coming to the sick with a word of comfort and a, and a word of prompting to them to call upon God, the Holy Spirit, through the name of Christ, to come to them in their time and bring comfort. And he got very secure in doing this. And pastors, we do this. We want to bring comfort. We want to comfort the afflicted. They say the pastor is also supposed to afflict the comfortable. But in this connection, he's talking about his role as comforting the afflicted. And he shows them from Scripture that the witness of, of Christ through the Spirit is available to them in these times. It's a special prompting. When the believer is in turmoil or restlessness or even in fear of his life, and the preacher was there to remind him that he had an intervening God, a God that was interested in his affliction, who was there with him, who would bring him through it or bring him to glory. But in either case, there would be a special measure of grace upon him. And so J. Vernon McGee, the preacher, would say this to people. And then he said, until that one day when I was the patient, and now I was in the hospital, and if you know anything about him, he had cancer, he was a survivor for some time, he had various... Uh, operations about it. I have not had cancer, but I've had other work done. I've been in that position myself. So I had an affinity with his understanding of this. And so he had to seek the comfort that he told other people to seek. And it was there for him. And so he writes, at a time like that, the Spirit of God cries out, Abba, Father. It just wells up within you how sweet it is to trust him, to turn yourself over to him. And I have to say that I have had that exact experience. And as I've told you, it was this chapter that I turned to in that moment. The dual witness of word and spirit offered a comfort that I could not find within me apart from the witness of God in his word. And I believe that the Holy Spirit is always with us and in us and available to us on occasions like this to bring comfort and to bring assurance. For how could we have assurance without the Spirit of God bearing witness of our spirit to assure us? But yet I don't see that that quite encapsulates the meaning of this verse. Matthew Henry, too, he had a mere three or four sentences. And he too described it as an ordinary leading, a thing experienced by every believer in a quiet and completely unextraordinary way. And he adds with it a warning, though, of falsely confusing the inner spirit with the Holy Spirit, which we're always on guard for. And so Matthew Henry writes Many a man has the witness of his own spirit to the goodness of his state. In other words, we're always ready to comfort ourselves by telling us how good we are. And he says, many have that spirit who has not the concurring testimony of the Holy Spirit. 
Many speak peace to themselves to whom the God of heaven does not speak peace. But those that are sanctified have God's spirit witnessing with their spirits. And I think certainly he's correct in this. So it seems the theologian foresees the possibility of a false assurance attached to the promise. But still again, I'm not satisfied that that nails down the meaning of the verse. Calvin, I think, comes a little closer and writes a little more on it. He said, Paul means that the Spirit of God gives us such a testimony that when he is our guide and teacher, our spirit is made assured of the adoption of God for our mind of its own self without the preceding testimony of the Spirit could not convey to us this assurance. He goes on. He says, there's also here an explanation of the former verse, for when the Spirit testifies to us that we are the children of God, He at the same time pours into our hearts such confidence that we venture to call God our Father. And then further he writes, and doubtless, And doubtless, since the confidence of the heart alone opens our mouth, except the Spirit testifies to our heart, respecting the paternal love of God, our tongues would be dumb, so that they could utter no prayers. For we must ever hold fast to this principle, that we do not rightly pray to God, unless we are surely persuaded in our hearts that He is our Father, when we so call Him so with our lips." So I will say that as I read the passage, it seems to me that Calvin comes closest to what I see as the plain reading of the passage. Though I don't doubt the other voices is referring to an aspect of the witness of God's Spirit upon ours, it seems to me that the thing the Apostle refers to here is an act of God that cannot be confused. I don't think the Spirit bearing witness with your spirit is something that can be confused. I think it's recognizable when that witness happens. It cannot be conjured by you. It cannot be accomplished in you without him. It's accomplished from outside. The spirit moves in or alongside, as some like to say. It's an action of the spirit, again, that's done to us. And so the emphasis is meaningful. The spirit himself beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. In other words, the spirit offers proof of our adoption in this moment. Lloyd-Jones, the esteemed brother, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, unlike these others, commits several lengthy sermons to the verse. Like any good Puritan, you just belabor a word or a passage or a verse to death and you go on and on elaborating on it. But it is always amazing to me how much thought can go into the deep things of God. And uh, Brother Martin Lloyd-Jones certainly did that in his series, as I've told you, that he preached for 13 years on Friday nights in the Westminster Chapel from 1955 to 68. So a good portion of an entire volume of his exposition on Romans is committed to unlocking the true biblical meaning of this verse. His emphasis is that a first rule of exegesis or exposition is that we do not attempt to unlock the meaning of God's word by appealing to our own experience. As much as we're tempted to do that, and as much as at times our experiences make for good illustrations, it's a bad practice to say the word must mean this because I experienced this. And we want to be careful of that, right? That's what we tend to see in the church today. It's very man-centered and not God-centered. Lloyd-Jones isn't taking the bait here. And so a first rule is that only Scripture may interpret Scripture, and so it behooves us to search for, for companion verses that speak to the same thing that's said to us in this verse. In this connection, then, we're not looking for promises or intervening moments of comfort, 
That's not what's spoken of here. The scripture, particularly the Psalms, are full of such promises. They're not hard to find. They're, they're powerful and they're comforting. I mean, who of us hasn't looked to the Psalms in a time of trial and trouble? I think I go there every day for that. Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength. And the spirit within you empowers you to know that's true. He's a very present help in trouble, the psalmist wrote. Psalm 37, commit your way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. That would bring us comfort because the spirit is in us. Very famously, Psalm 91, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In him I will trust. And who hasn't derived some great measure of comfort from Psalm 91? The word without the presence of God within us would be a, a thin assurance, wouldn't it? But with word and spirit working together in our consciousness, the comfort is real and it is restful. However, that's not the subject of this verse. Paul speaking about salvation and about the assurance of salvation. That's what he's dealing with. He's not talking specifically about those times we all go through where we need an extra measure of comfort. The Holy Spirit's there. It's part of his ministry. But this verse, if we take it in conjunction with other verses about this subject, is not speaking about that action of the Spirit. He's teaching on the subject of the process by which we are saved and the access we're granted into assurance of salvation. Recall verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Assurance is the business of the Spirit and the subject of this passage. And with regard to our verse for today, this and the, the preceding verses are speaking on the subject of salvation and of assurance. It's been said that a person can be saved without assurance. How many of us have doubted our salvation because of our unworthiness? We needn't doubt our salvation there is assurance provided. That's what this verse talks about. But a person, so a person can be saved and not be assured. But a cursed person cannot be saved without the Holy Spirit. And so we read, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. Friends, these verses are not a promise of anything per se. They are a triumphant declaration of what's been accomplished. They are the apostles' description of the spiritual benefit of belief in the one true God and Jesus Christ his, himself. So first, the Spirit comes and we're led. We're led to mortify sin. The leading is to put away the deeds of the body. Secondly, we're given special access to grace. And we call out to God as his sons and daughters. And thirdly, we're given this witness and therefore, something of the presence and something of the power of God. And the emphasis that the apostle gives with saying the Spirit himself. We're met by God here. The power comes in no other way than by the unimpeachable assurance of the presence of God in us. And this meeting creates within believers a zeal to become witnesses themselves. I suggest to you that's what happened at Pentecost. And so we read from Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. 
Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Is this filling of the Holy Spirit the same work of the Spirit spoken of in the verse of bearing witness? Friends, that is a far cry from the still, small voice examples of the commentators. The Holy Spirit may be quiet, or he may be boisterous. And I use this example so that we don't, do not judge the witness of the Spirit by our experience only. We have a record of his appearing. We only serve to de-glorify the promises and actions of God when we commit to judging them by our own experience and not by the vast, vast treasure trove of evidences given us in scriptures of those far more glorious examples of the Spirit of God bearing witness with the sons of God. Before we turn to those examples, however, let me give a quick primer on the word witness. In the Greek, the word is martis. That's the noun. Does it sound like anything? In the English, we use the word martyr. It's one who bears witness by his death. That's the word used here. The specific verb form in this verse is the word sumatureo. It means to bear witness, to proclaim, and to declare. To declare what? The Holy Spirit comes in us with this particular verb form that has only one meaning. It's to provide the witness, which is the witness to proclaim and to declare. To declare what? That we are witnesses. And in this connection, we too have died. We've died with Christ. We too are empowered by the death of Christ. They thought they killed him and us with him. They were right. But what the crucifiers did not know is that it was his death that unleashed the power of God into the souls of his sons, of his sons' disciples. Friends, Jesus said, I must go, because if I do not go, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, will not come. He wanted that witness in the world. We saw the disciples. We saw them fearful. We saw bravado in one disciple who said, I'll never turn on you, and within hours denied his Lord in a mere few minutes on his last day on earth, in his most torturous moment of his life. The witness of the Spirit wasn't with him, not in the sense that Paul's speaking of here. The witness of the Spirit in, the, in this verse is in connection with the promised inheritance, but no one receives an inheritance unless someone dies. Death precedes inheritance. The witness of the Spirit imparts into, this, into the disciple the certain expectation of receiving all that the Father has stored up for his children. If we're children, then we're heirs. We're heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. The Spirit is bearing witness of that truth in our lives. And it is not mistakable. I submit to you today, it is not a still, small voice, but maybe a rushing mighty wind. This ought to be an empowering declaration, but it only empowers those who are inwardly possessed of the Holy Spirit of God himself. And the Spirit himself is God. And the witness of God puts a real and lasting change in the hearts of his recipients. Like those disciples who gathered in the upper room. Friends, imagine this. 120 people. Devout followers of Christ. Not empowered yet in the way that Christ had prepared for them. And he asked one thing of them. He came back. They saw him. That gave them Great comfort to see him. They told each other. Some didn't believe and needed proof. You remember the stories. But now he asked them one thing. After many days with him in his resurrected state, teaching them, ascending into heaven, as Luke said, and we saw him go. And then they were left bereft once again, just between themselves and what they believed. And Jesus asked one thing of them. He asked them to wait. Tarry a while in the city of Jerusalem, he said, 
So they went into the upper room. I can hardly imagine it. 120 disciples, three years of ministry on the earth, and the Lord had a mere 120 devout disciples. Guess what? That's all he would need once they were infilled with the Spirit of God. That's all they would need. They were lost. They were longing. They were wondering what they're to do, what they are to do now that the Savior has departed them. I often said, imagine the disciples that made excuses that day and didn't show up. Imagine the ones that texted in their excuse. Can't be there. Imagine what they would have missed. And then when the 120 went out and said, you aren't going to believe it, but the building was shaken. There was fire on our heads. The Spirit of God came into us. We could speak in every language known to man on the streets only minutes later and see thousands converted to Christ. Oh, I don't believe it. I had business in Africa that day. I couldn't be there. They were lost. They were longing. They were wandering and wondering what they ought to do now that the Savior has departed. He came back for a time, and it seemed like a mere moment. He showed himself, but even those things faded into memory. The intervening spirit revives memory, though, friends. And it makes reality of memory once again. Consider Jesus' promises of this very thing. Where we read from the Gospel of John, On the last day, the great day of the feast... Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. In other words, the Spirit coming in, bearing witness with the Spirit of those disciples, gave them this witness, this witness of being the ones who declared the Christ boldly. All we need to do to understand the inner witness of the Spirit is to recall the condition of the disciples before and after the Spirit came into them. Peter denied him. The others scattered in fear. After Pentecost, they're different men, different spirits. They were believers before the upper room, but they're witnesses now because the Spirit flooded in. The witness of the Spirit draws the disciples' thoughts away from himself in the present and draws our thoughts to our destination, our inheritance. He goes right from this bearing witness to the inheritance that awaits us. We're no longer bound to the realities of this life. Friends, we are freed by the Spirit, by this action. We no longer have to fear the losses and troubles of this life. It's as if our spirit rejoices in saying, so what if I'm poor? So what if I'm sick? The Spirit of God is in me to urge me to consider what I have in heaven. It's a spirit that allows us to let go of this life with its love of the world and its material goods. They cared for one thing only, and that was the, to witness of the truth of the gospel. And we see it all throughout those chapters. The witness of the Holy Spirit, friends, is not subtle. It is not quiet. It is not mistakable. He brings wind and fire when he comes. He brings with him the promise fulfilled that as Christ has died, so have we died with him. He suffered and we suffer, just like the verse says. But like him, we also look forward to the fulfillment of the promise. And it's not just deduced from the written word, though it may be deduced from the written word, for let God be true and every man a liar. But it's alive in us who have died to self. Which we did in the last verse. We died to self. We mortified the deeds of the flesh in the last verse. And he's building upon it. There's a new witness to come. And it is the witness that makes you witness. It makes you dead to Christ. It is the martyrs. It's not only alive, but it's our life's new confidence. Out of our souls, out of our spirits, out of our mouths flow rivers of living water that didn't used to flow out, but they do now. 
because the Spirit is there. And so the scared and tired disciples who tarried in Jerusalem were suddenly filled and emboldened with assurance. They left all behind them. Friends, how many of us would take 10 days off to wait for the Lord with our friends? And how long would it be, day three maybe, when we said, I don't think he's coming? I mean, I, I don't know. How long would you wait? You know, I heard a preacher say, if you go into that room and you tell God you're going to be there till he meets you, you won't be there long. But you better mean it when you go in. They left all behind them and took hold of their new lives of declaring him, for the Spirit himself bore witness with their spirits. They had nothing else on their minds. You may say, Pastor, how do I know I'm a Christian? I've had no such witness. And I don't doubt it. I'd say to you, you have the, the assurance of the word. There are different forms or different tests for assurance that validate our profession of faith. The first is deduction from the scriptures. Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God? Even that can't be done without the spirit. You could know it cover to cover. I had professors in college that knew the Bible cover to cover that didn't have an ounce of faith or witness of the Spirit. In fact, would deny this very thing as myth and legend. No, you need the Spirit of God to even believe in the Word of God. There's a first test. And what does the Bible say that you now know by faith is God's Word? What does it say? It says Jesus Christ is Lord and there is no other name in heaven or earth given among men by which we must be saved. That's all by the Spirit of God. But you have the Word of God assuring you of that. Do you know what the Bible says about salvation? It says that he that believes is not condemned. The believer knows that God must be true to his Word. And so he's assured by the promise that he who believes in him is saved by him. God is able to accomplish, Abraham knew, what he has promised. There are a number of similar passages that speak of having passed from death to life. The Word tells us that there's no, under, no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. But there is another witness. It's the one that him, the Spirit himself comes with, bearing witness with our spirits that we're children of God. And if we're children, then heirs. And so we see this witness evident in the life of the apostles. They knew who they were. They were not afraid to face death and everything that came with it. But they were not too busy for God. And so we see this witness evident in the life of the apostles. Peter and John healed a lame man at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate. You remember? He healed, Peter healed a lame man before the Sanhedrin, and they asked by what power he had done this. So we read, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, let it be known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. Friends, the healing was just an emblem. The preaching was the witness. That was the leading of the Spirit. That was the witness of the Spirit with Peter's Spirit. Only by the witness of the Spirit himself are such things possible. Remember Cornelius in chapter 10 of Acts. He was praying and fasting and asking God to bless him. What did God do in response? He sent Peter with the gospel. He sent an angel to Cornelius and told him Peter was coming. And as the apostle preached, the Holy Spirit came upon all those who were in the house. That's the Spirit sidling up with our spirits, with the spirits of all those who heard the preaching. While Peter was still speaking these words, we read, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. Those in attendance received the Holy Spirit and evidenced it by speaking in tongues as the disciples at the upper room did. And in case you think I'm leaning towards everyone that has this witness speaks in tongues, I'm not. It's a biblical absurdity to say so. Paul said to the Corinthians, do all speak in tongues? Do all do works of miracle? Of course not. We all have compartmentalized places as members in a body. 
So no, they don't all speak in tongues, but it was a sign gift in a number of instances in the early church where that was unmistakably the sign of the Holy Spirit bearing witness with the spirit of a formerly unshriven person. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Those in attendance received the Holy Spirit. Peter commanded them to be baptized. The witness of the Spirit did all these things. We might say of this witness that we do not see this type of pouring out of the Spirit as we saw in those times. You know, there's a wonderful line in a, one of Karen and my favorite movies. I probably should admit this, but there's an old movie from, I think, the 80s called Moonstruck. There's a lot of Italian culture in Moonstruck, and we get off on seeing our relatives in the, in the roles here. But uh, Cher is the lead character, and she's actually a very good actress. And at one point, she's playing this Italian woman, and her husband had gone, her husband-to-be had gone away to Sicily because his mother was dying. But his mother came back to life suddenly, and they were claiming it was a miracle. And so he claims he couldn't marry her anymore because if he did, his mother would die. Very superstitious. And what did Cher say? I think she said what most of us say. She said, this is modern times. They're not supposed to be miracles no more. I mean, how many of us really think that way? How many of you want to accuse me for being charismatic? You know, Lloyd Jones was accused of being charismatic. They went to his kids and grandkids and said, oh, I know your father's preaching. He's a charismatic. Friends, the man was a Puritan, and some of the early Puritans would qualify as charismatic. For those of us who love that whole tradition, I would have you know. But it's not charismatic in any sense but the biblical one. As the apostle preached the word, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who believed. We can say, oh, my experience is this, my experience is that. Well, this, it, well the experience given us of the apostles in Scripture is this. Surely such things are characteristic of the early days of Christianity and not of our day. There's not supposed to be miracles no more. We have science now. Follow the science. Isn't that funny that they say that? Jesus said, follow me, and we here follow the science. And by the way, if you're following Jesus, you'll come across true science. He's the author of both. So I'd say to you two things about all this. First, the Apostle Paul did experience this great outpouring of the Spirit. Can we really believe that his teaching is a sanitized version of events to soothe the consciences of believers 2,000 years in the future who have given up on the miraculous. Is that what he had in mind? When the zeal of the church has been softened and suspected and watered down and man-centered, is that what he's talking about? No. He's giving us the original. Or is the teaching of the witness of the Spirit an outgrowth of his experience and not an anticipation of our experience? It's an outgrowth of his experience. What did he say? I speak in tongues more than all of you. They lived their faith in the moment, friends. Maybe it's because they had to. Maybe that's the reason. We fit faith into our lives. They lived their faith in the moment. Maybe because they gave all to Christ in their calling. The witness we see in Scripture is the complete giving over of themselves to God and of God completely given, giving over of himself to them. So we can compare Scripture with Scripture or Scripture with personal experience. And I suspect that as Christian zeal cools over the years, over the centuries, that experience has become the lens of truth at last. We just don't see those things anymore. We've become suspect of the miraculous and estranged from the divine. And so to soothe ourselves, we say, well, I haven't had that. It therefore doesn't happen that way. I'll also point out that the need, need is the mother of devotion. Have you ever noted that? Notice that? When have you prayed the hardest? When you're in the most trouble. Need is the mother of devotion. It's when need was foremost in your mind. 
You know, you know, isn't it interesting that when you consider the sovereignty of God in your moment of dire need and anxious anticipation of the outcome of the turmoil in your lives, that you're really in no different a position before God as you were just before you got the phone call. It's just now you know. You're really in the same position all the time. I think men like Cornelius knew that. He fasted and prayed. He gave to the temple. He knew the God of Israel was the God of the Bible. Now, that didn't earn him his salvation, but it earned him the attention of the Savior. When have you prayed the most? It's when your need was foremost in your mind. Noticed one difference from the saints in our example. What's the difference between them and us? One, they tarried. Tarry ye a while, once in a while. I said to a person one time, I went out to pray. As you know, I got on Crooked Lane. You're not allowed to go there because that's my area. But um, I went out, I prayed. I came back hours later. There was times when I prayed out there where I didn't want to come back. It was such a sweet, to talk about the sweet hour of prayer. And people said, how do you pray that long? I don't know, I've got a lot of things to say to God, I guess. They waited uninterruptedly for God for 10 days, and there's no indication they would have stopped if he decided not to come in 10 days. They were told to wait until they were endued with promised power. It's like Jacob wrestling with the man at night. I won't let you go till you bless me. And he wrestled with God and prevailed, the Bible says. He's a wrestler. Peter and John risked personal safety. They even risked their own lives because they were empowered by the witness of the Spirit bearing witness with their witness. And we read, after the religious authority called the apostles in front of them and beaten them, we read, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's the witness of the Holy Spirit in them. They had nothing but God's prompting and God's concerns on their minds. And so the disciples tarried, and so they prayed. Peter and John preached against custom and persisted against orders. Cornelius fasted and prayed and gathered friends and family to meet with the apostle. He heard from the angel that Peter was coming, so he gathered everyone together to be there when the prophet came. I wonder if commitment's not the difference. I've often marveled at the statement of the angel to Cornelius in prayer. The angel said, Cornelius, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Though our works and our offerings cannot buy us salvation, they may gain the attention of the Savior. I'm going to close with an old story. I was told many years ago, A.W. Criswell, in his exposition of the book of Acts, and he told the story of a what he called a mighty theologian, Duns Scotus, from the 14th century. And he went to visit the Pope in Rome, the great, powerful theologian. And the Pope spoke of Peter. And the Pope spoke of what Peter said to the lame man at the gate, which we just discussed. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I don't have gold to give you, but I can take away your reason for begging for gold. That power I have. There was a chest nearby filled with the offerings of the saints. There was a treasure chest in the Vatican. Well, the pre-Vatican. Gold and silver, jewelry and coins from every nation, and the Pope greedily ran his hands through the treasures, and he said, No longer does the church have to say, Silver and gold have I none. And Duns Scotus answered and said, 
But neither can she say, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Father, in Jesus' name I pray, we do not trade our material things for spiritual things, or material devotion for spiritual devotion. Father, I pray a special measure of the witness of the spirit of boldness upon us in this time when it is dire needed, O Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.